Providence, the home of Howard Phillips Lovecraft. As a Lovecraftian, it is almost an obligation to visit this beautiful historical city that is so intrinsically a part of Lovecraft's life and mythos. One need only pick up one of his stories to see him mentioning real places one can visit today. And finally, I was able to do just that. From May 21st to the 24th of 2019, I went to Providence to experience the ultimate in Eldridge tourism and visit the site suited to a Lovecraft fan. Before I went though, I made sure to have some plan on what to see and what to do, so I went to Lovecraft's official website and looked up the College Hill walking tour which highlights all the key points of interest to a Lovecraftian. Some of the entries on the lists held no interest to me though and that was just for personal reasons and so I didn't view everything on the list. Also partly because my time was limited in Providence and also also, I was on holiday and just wanted to switch off a bit, enjoy my first time in the United States and have some obligation free hours with a cigar and some nice bourbon. So in no particular order, here are the sites I visited in Providence and the ones I most recommend seeing. Oh, and just so you know, many of, but not all the pictures in this video are taken by me during the trip. I did have to flesh out this video with a bit of help from Google Images, just so you know. Okay, let's go. My first stop was the John Hay Library, known for keeping many of the letters, notes and physical copies of Lovecraft's writings. It is located opposite of Brown University at 20 Prospect Street. It is a very historical building, big and imposing with elegant stonework and steps, and the interior was well preserved and looked borderline like a museum in subsections. Once inside, I asked the staff to see the Lovecraft papers, and as if it were a routine operation, as it probably is, they guided me to a quiet sitting room and brought out a box of his short stories. It is possible to request to see specific letters or documents, but they have a box that is the standard thing shown to Lovecraftian tourists, so I settled with that. Sadly, but not surprisingly, the contents were all photocopies of the originals. I can understand that, but I had hoped to see at least actual paper and handwriting from him, at least in a display case, considering a lot of the people coming to this library must have been interested in Lovecraft. Nonetheless, I relished this moment. The box presented had all the greatest hits, as it were, of Lovecraft's stories. The Call of Cthulhu, Azathoth, At the Mountains of Madness, case of Charles Dix the Ward, and so on. Some were typed, some handwritten. I got to say, maybe it's my fault for being a millennial who never had much occasion to write by hand, but damn, his handwriting is quite hard to read sometimes. Some of the stories, for example, The Call of Cthulhu, were typed, but still had his handwriting on the manuscript and all the imperfections one would expect from an old typewriter. Very pleasing. And I couldn't help but recall with a sense of amusement and irony scenes from Lovecraft's stories of characters poring over old documents about horrific monsters. Outside of the library there is a large stone with a metal plaque placed in memory to Lovecraft. It was really a great tribute to the importance of the library and its connection to Lovecraft. Well crafted and I had to grab a selfie there. Right near the John Hay Library and on the Brown University campus itself, are the Van Winkle Gates, famous to students more than anything as they have some tradition related to the university and while elegant in the design, I would have easily overlooked it had I not known of this photo of Lovecraft sitting on the stone bench right beside them. Unfortunately, a group of students were apparently graduating or had been admitted and were doing a photo shoot there, making taking a good photo difficult. Still, I managed to get a seat there briefly. Judging from the old photo and what I saw in real life, this spot remains almost exactly like it did during Lovecraft's time and the idea of sitting on the exact same spot as he did touching the exact same brickwork, a really cool sensation. I've often had this mental exercise that I do. Imagine a specific place that you've been to some months ago, or a year, or five years ago. Then, when revisiting this area, try to imagine the specific action you were doing then, and then, from a third person perspective, sort of see yourself doing it. It's kind of like viewing a hologram of yourself basically. I don't know why, but I've always done that ever since I was a kid. That's what I did imagining Lovecraft sitting there, you know, moving around, sort of commenting on the weather to whoever was taking the photo. It was almost like picturing him in a ghostly form. Pretty cool. The Fleur de Lis building. The Fleur de Lis building is located at 7 Thomas Street in the College Hill area on a rather steep hill going down towards the river there. This building featured in the Call of Cthulhu being the home of Henry Anthony Wilcox, as Lovecraft said, a thin dark man of neurotic and excited temperament. In the story Lovecraft described this place as 
a hideous Victorian imitation of 17th century Breton architecture which flaunts its stuccoed front amidst the lovely colonial houses on the ancient hill and under the very shadow of the finest Georgian steeple in America. Seeing this building and its blatant disregard for conformity to the surrounding area's architecture, I can understand why Lovecraft got so salty about its existence. I feel the same thing about architecture in Switzerland. Nonetheless, it is a unique piece of beautiful architecture, and quite easily, because of its disregard to conformity, one can imagine it as the dwelling of a person like Henry Anthony Wilcox. And at 10 Thomas Street, just a bit up from the Fleur de Lis building, is actually the Providence Art Club, which Lovecraft also mentioned in The Call of Cthulhu. Sixty-five Prospect Street, aka Sixty-six College Street. At this location, one can find one of the few homes that Lovecraft lived in during his life in Providence. I should note that this house was originally located at Sixty-six College Street when he was alive, but was moved after his death. This was also the last house that he lived in before he died. It's a house that I've come to recognize as being typical of Providence. It has a large garden and trees surrounding the actual building, large sunny windows, and a general feeling of being a very mellow place to live, like Providence in general, I think. From all photos I've seen of the property when Lovecraft lived there, the place almost looks unchanged despite having been moved in later years. Notably, this house was the inspiration for the house that featured in The Haunter of the Dark. It is also worth mentioning that nearby at the crossing of Prospect and Angel Street there is the H.P. Lovecraft Memorial Square, but despite a modest yet elegant sign, there is not much to see here. Angel Street and Barn Street Sadly, I didn't manage to see Lovecraft's homes located at 10 Barn Street and 598 Angel Street. As I said before, my time was limited and in retrospect, I feel that since my tour of Providence is unfinished, I'm highly motivated to go back, this time for a longer period to complete the experience. However, I was in Angel Street for a while, just on the other end from his home. It was very lively, full of college students and a lot of shops catering to college students, bars, simple restaurants, bookstores and the like. It reminded me strongly of my times as a student in Stellenbosch, South Africa. A lot of colonial architectures, winding streets, filled with beautiful green trees, a lot of students going around happily, some drunk probably, and it just had a great atmosphere that was very nostalgic, especially considering that it was my first time in America. The Lovecraft Arts and Sciences Shop Merchandise is the part of any tourist agenda and the go-to place is the Lovecraft Arts and Sciences Shop, which is located in the Arcade, reportedly America's oldest shopping center. Apart from the obvious books of Lovecraft stories you'd expect, of which there are various collections, there was a plethora of other books too. Weird fiction, secondhand horror and sci-fi books, non-fiction books about Lovecraft, fiction from other Lovecraftian writers, graphic novels, the Call of Cthulhu RPG game and guides, and then there were also some other miscellaneous books as well, mainly about philosophy. Also on sale were some board games, t-shirts, figurines, maps of providence, those audio CDs from the HP Lovecraft Historical Society, and then some random odds and ends, all related to Lovecraft of course. All in all, a very well stocked shop and worth a visit. I was a bit disappointed though to notice that the shop was also selling utter shit like the heroes of Red Hook and Lovecraft Country, even putting it proudly on display in the window next to the propaganda poster stating, we the people. Tell me, is this the average American? Hmm. Why is this pissing me off? Well, the blurb of Heroes of Red Hook reads like this. Our heroes and heroines are members of ethnic and religious minorities, immigrants, independent free-thinking women, those with special needs and members of the LGBT community. This collection features people struggling to overcome not only the horrors beyond mankind's understanding, but an oppressive society seeking to deny them basic human rights. Ah yes, feminists, trannies and the mentally handicapped fighting the white patriarchy with token deep ones thrown in to justify the Lovecraftian horror label. Cornerstones of any good Lovecraft story, am I right guys? What was this shop thinking? They put this trash proudly on display in the window in a shop dedicated solely to Lovecraft, located in his hometown of all places? Is this really what fans of Lovecraft are going shopping for? I seriously doubt that. Nonetheless, it is a well-packed store and I do recommend going there for a visit and the guy inside was friendly enough, so... Lovecraft's Grave This, this was the big one. 
This location alone would have motivated me to make the trip. Lovecraft is buried in Swan Point Cemetery, a massive piece of land greener than any place I have ever seen, with winding paths twisting through the thousands of graves dating back on average to 150 years I'd wager. Finding the grave proved troublesome, but a kind elderly couple saw me gawking at a map and said, you're looking for the Lovecraft grave, right? Apparently tourism to his grave is in no short supply. His grave is a very modest one. It is located behind about a 3 meter high obelisk type structure, a structure dedicated to the Phillips family but which is also engraved with his name. I always wondered why Lovecraft used the name Howard Phillips Lovecraft and not just Howard Lovecraft, and given the prominence of the family, I guess that's why. His grave itself is not at all remarkable from the others surrounding it except that the grass on his grave is yellowed and flattened from the constant stream of visitors and perhaps this is even more of a sign of how loved he is than if he had some massive monument just for himself, something I think he'd have hated to have. On that day I found a row of coins on the gravestone to which I added a 50 rappen coin and upon the grass some pencils and a homemade Cthulhu clay statue were to be found. Being at the grave was an unforgettable event for me, something I wanted to do for many many years. I know that when one pays respects at a grave typically one says something or expresses their thoughts. I have to admit, I drew a blank for quite a while and I just stood there looking upon the grave, kind of in shock and I didn't know what to say. I was finally here. I know he is but bones now and being an atheist that he is and I'm an atheist as well, there's not really any point in saying anything to each other but it felt like it needed to be done. I mean it's Lovecraft, I was here and I was about 6 feet away from him. I think in the end I simply said something along the lines of thanks for everything Howard and then I left. So, that was my trip to Providence. In general, mm, I wish I could have seen more places. His home's at 10 Barn Street and the other one in Angel Street for example, but uh, next time. I think I can understand why he loved the place so much and I feel like I did get a better understanding of Lovecraft and the man that he was. For me, the biggest highlight of Providence was knowing that in a town so historic, I was walking on many of the same streets and seeing many of the same places that Lovecraft did in his life. Besides that, I finally got to meet up with a subscriber for the first time. It was great to meet someone in real life who is also into Lovecraft and has the same mindset that I have. He gave me this bottle of Lovecraft whiskey that I now use as a carafe for my rum. I'm looking forward to meeting up with you again pretty soon, huh? Anyway, that's my video. I hope you liked it and I hope to upload something again very soon. Cheers.